Well, in the year 1247, a monastery was established in London, England, and the, this monastery was called St. Mary's of Bethlehem. Now, in the 14th century, that monastery was changed into a hospital. And a little later in the 14th century, it was changed into a mental hospital, and the name was shortened from St. Mary's of Bethlehem to simply Bethlehem. And in that politically incorrect day, people from London would go to the Bethlehem Mental Hospital for amusement. They would look at the strange people there and sort of entertain themselves in that way. Well, as time passed, the name Bethlehem was shortened to Bethlehem, and finally to Bedlam, Bedlam Mental Hospital. And because of that, over the passage of time, the word Bedlam has come to refer to lunacy, chaos, confusion, pandemonium, and so it is today. We use the word bedlam in that way, especially around here as we talk about the bedlam series every time OU and OSU play each other in anything. But isn't it strange how the name Bethlehem could come to be associated with chaos, pandemonium, and bedlam? And yet it seems kind of appropriate because Christmas has become a kind of bedlam in our society today. But with all the shopping to do, meals to prepare, decorations to put up, Presents to wrap, holiday traffic, bowl games, mistletoe, Santa Claus, and reindeer. Many people, in the midst of all this pandemonium, it's really easy to lose sight of what Christmas is really all about. Well, if you trace it back to its origins, it was in a common stable that the first Christmas celebration was held. And at Christmas time each year, we come back to that little infant in a stable. But this morning... We're asking the question, who was that baby? Who was that little infant baby in that manger? Well, right now, I'd like to ask you to, to use your imaginations for a moment. Imagine that you could travel through time 2,000 years and be present the night in the stable where the little baby named Jesus was born. Now, only a handful of people are there, and you're privileged to be among them. Of course, there's Mary and Joseph. There are the shepherds who have come after the angels had appeared to him, them, and, and then there's you. Now suppose the new mother is resting, the baby is asleep, and so you and the shepherds are kind of warming your hands by the fire, and one of them turns to you and says, well, who is this baby lying in the manger? Who is this? How would you answer them? Well, that's the question I want to address today. And to do so, first we're going to roll back the videotape of history way back, because to fully understand who this newborn baby is, we have to see who he was before he became the Christ child. In the book of, first, uh, book of John, verse 1, we rewind the videotape of history where it says, in the beginning was the Word. And later down in verse 14, we learn that the Word was Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, those words, in the beginning, was a phrase that meant before there were ever, was ever even such a notion as time. In the beginning, Jesus was there. Jesus, being the second member of the Trinity, had existed before the beginning of time. He is eternal. He lives outside of time. So think about it. Jesus, who as God had never been restricted by time or space, was willing to be reduced to a microscopic cell in the womb of a peasant woman. That's who was lying in the manger that night. But that's not the only thing we discover as we rewind the tape of history. We also find that this helpless newborn was the creator of everything there is. In, first, in John 1 verse 3 it says, Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Can you imagine saying that to the shepherd who asked, who is that lying in the manger? Who is this little baby? Can you imagine saying, well, you're not going to believe this, but that little baby was the maker of all things. The baby that just came from the womb of Mary is the creator of the universe. He is the one who spoke the word, and out of nothing came everything. And now this one who could speak the world into existence as a tiny baby who can't say a single word. That's who's lying in the manger. Well, the third thing you could tell that inquisitive shepherd that night is found in the next couple of verses in John chapter 1. In him was life, and that life 
was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. In him was life. Who was lying in the manger? Well, this little baby born 2,000 years ago in a humble, in a humble uh, stable, sta stable is the hope of all humanity. He is going to be the only hope of a meaningful life in this world and certainly the only hope of eternal life in the next. And so next time you see a picture of a manger on a Christmas card or drive by a nativity scene or see a painting of the little baby Jesus, remember that little newborn lying in the manger is the only hope for life for all of humankind. Then in the next couple of verses, it says that the one who would fulfill Old Testament prophecy. That's who was lying in the manger. It says, there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. This was John the Baptist. He came to, as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. You know, when Jesus was born and lying where cattle eat in a common stable, you could have turned to that questioning shepherd and said to you, that baby, that little baby is the culmination of hundreds and hundreds of Old Testament prophecies. Prophecies from the book of Psalms, Isaiah, Genesis, Joel, Jeremiah, Deuteronomy. Prophecies written hundreds of years before the fact. Very specific predictions about his ancestry, about the exact city of his birth, his journey to Egypt, and then settling in Nazareth. Prophecies that foretold the kind of miracles that he would perform. That's found in Isaiah chapters 32 and 35. That he would teach in parables. That's found in Psalm 78 verse 2. That he would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41 verse 9. For 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11 verse 12. Isaiah 53 gives an amazingly detailed description of the life and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and it was a, written a full 700 years before it happened. That would be like you and I sitting out down today trying to make specific predictions of things that were going to happen in the year 2716. Let me read you just a few of the prophecies of Christ's crucifixion as foretold in Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 7, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Verse 16, a band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Other Old Testament scriptures were told that he would be crucified with thieves, that he would be pierced in the side, that the darkness would cover the land, and that he would rise from the grave. All in all, there are 332 distinct, specific predictions that are fulfilled in Christ. Now, a man named Peter Stoner in his book, Science Speaks, took just eight Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and calculated what the odds were that these eight prophecies could be fulfilled hundreds, many hundreds of years later in one man living in history. He computed and found the odds to be one chance in 10 to the 17th power. That is 10 followed by 17 zeros. Then he calculated it on 48 Old Testament prophecies. What if 48 of these prophecies written hundreds of years before were fulfilled by one person in human history? The odds of that were a chance of 10 with 157 zeros to follow. That's 48 specific prophecies and there are actually 332 of them. Who is that little baby laying in the manger? Well, he, he's the eternal God. That's the creator of all things. He's the giver of life. He was the one who would fulfill the words of the prophets. Well, fifth, that little infant asleep in the cattle stable is the one person in human history about whom everyone else will ultimately have to make a decision. This is found in John 1, verses 10 through 12. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him or accept him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who would receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. As he grew up, some would 
reject him. Some would receive him, but there were sobering eternal consequences either way. Well, now what I want to do is go the other way in history and run the videotape of history ahead, way ahead, to the very end of the world as we know it and into eternity. Because if we want to really comprehend who is lying in the manger, first we've got to understand the past, but we've also got to understand eternity future. We had to see who and what Jesus was before he became the Christ child and now who and what he is now and forevermore. Well, as we roll the tape forward, one of the first things we say, see is that Jesus Christ will have been the centerpiece of all of human history. That little infant lying in the manger on that night turned out to be the dividing point in history. Everything up until his birth would be known as B.C., before his Christ. Everything after his birth is known as A.D. And when all is said and done with life on planet Earth is over, Jesus Christ will prove to have been the centerpiece of all of human history. The second thing we see from the perspective of eternity future is that this infant Jesus will have gone on to become the most profound and influential teacher who ever lived. When he finished his classic Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, we read that his hearers were amazed. They were spellbound. They were moved. They were transfixed by his words. And that kind of response has been repeated countless times since. In fact, author Bernard Ram writes, The words of Jesus are read by more people, quoted by more authors, translated into more languages than any other words spoken by any man in any century in any land. But he writes, the words of Christ are not great solely on the grounds that they have a statistical edge on everybody else's words. They are read more, quoted more, loved more, believed more, and translated more because they are simply the greatest words ever spoken. And where is their greatness? It lies in their pure, clear, and authoritatively answering of the most compelling questions that probe the human heart. Namely, who is God? Does he care about me? How should I please him? How does he feel about my sin? How can I be forgiven? What is the purpose of my life? Where will I go when I die? How should I treat others? Jesus' words, he wrote, have transcended time because they appeal to the most fundamental questions that all people have. That is what you could tell your inquiring shepherd friend. This baby lying in the manger is going to go on to speak words that will profoundly impact life on planet earth. The third thing we see as we run the videotape of history ahead is that this little baby born in a common stable in a remote corner, corner of the world will be the only avenue for humankind to get to God. Acts 4 verse 12 spells it out succinctly. Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Calling upon the name of Muhammad isn't going to do you any good nor that believing that uh, Buddha or Gandhi or the Pope or any other religious leader or guru can get you in. Only Jesus Christ can get you to God. So who is the baby lying in the manger? That little baby is the way, the truth, and the life, and no woman or man comes to God except through that little baby. However, of course, some will not believe that. But there will come a day, the Bible says, when all of humankind will be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. This is said in, uh, in, in, Psalm, in Philippians 2, verses 9 and 10. That one day Christ is going to come again. And when he does, every person who has ever lived on this earth will bow their knee before him. And with their tongues, they will acknowledge that Jesus Christ truly was and is the Lord God Almighty. At his birth, only a handful of people witnessed his entrance into the world. But when he comes a second time, the Bible says that every eye will behold him and every tongue will acknowledge that this little baby born on Christmas night is God, the creator of everything, the hope of humanity, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the one of whom everyone else will have to make a decision about, the centerpiece of, of human history, the greatest teacher who ever lived, the only way to God, and the one at whose name every knee will bow. That's who we're going to be. You know, we all know that Christmas is 
about more than opening presents. It's about Jesus Christ coming to this world as a little baby who grew up into a great man who lived a perfect life. He performed incredible miracles. He taught great truths. He demonstrated the love of God to people who are hurting. And then he died on the cross, enduring the punishment that we deserve for our sins. And yet he took our punishment so that we could be saved from the penalty of our sins. That's why the Christmas angels proclaim, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, for unto you is born this day a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And if any of us here have not yet put our hope for eternal life into Christ and what he did for us on the cross, then you can do that today. Most of us have. That's when it became real for me when I said, Lord, I want to put my hope in the trust and confidence that Jesus came. And one of his main missions was to die on the cross, take the punishment that we deserve for our sins. And you say, Lord, I want that to come into my heart, into my soul. And he grant me the free gift of eternal life with him forever. That's what Christmas is. We're going to close the service with the